When sweep netting for insects, you don't usually have to look for something to chase after. The easiest way to catch them is by just walking along, sweeping the net back and forth. What this does is just kind of randomly catch whatever's sitting on the plants. Try to be delicate with the plants if you can. Uh, the net is a soft mesh, so it won't tear up too many of the uh, tougher plants. But I can see as I'm going along, I see some grasshoppers jumping out in front of me. Um, when I sweep net, I try to avoid the delicate animals, like butterflies and dragonflies. Butterflies have real soft wings, and if you get them caught in even a soft mesh net like this one, the, uh, the net will actually tear up the wings. In fact, I see a little skipper right here in front of me, a type of butterfly, and I'm just going to sweep right around him and not get him in the net. Butterflies are best looked at from a distance. Um, and by that, I mean I can stop and see him right here, sitting right in front of me. Um, you don't have to catch him in a net and look at him that way. It, by putting him in a net, you really are endangering its life. And with dragonflies, they like to eat mosquitoes and deer flies and other insects that like to eat us. So, and their wings are delicate, so I try to avoid catching dragonflies too. There's somebody kind of neat that just fell out. In fact, this is food for dragonflies right here. It's a horsefly. Now, looking in the net, I can see that I've caught a number of things already, mostly a number of flies. There's some ants in there, um, typical insects that hang out on plants. Now, one rule about using a sweep net, oh, he got away. Um, after you've used a sweep net, or even before you use one, uh, a couple of safety tips. Don't ever put a net over your head. You can breathe through this. It's not like putting a plastic bag over your head, but you don't know what's in here. It may have been swept through poison ivy, and the poison ivy oil could be on the net itself, and if you put that over your head, then you're putting poison ivy oil on you. But also, if I used this net yesterday and caught up something and thought that I cleaned it out and got all the animals out, I may be mistaken. There may be something still in there, a small wasp, maybe a fire ant, and then uh, playing around with the net by putting it on somebody's head could actually endanger that person. So don't ever put it on anybody's head. The other rule about using a net is don't open it up and reach down inside. You don't need to do that. By reaching down in there very quickly, you may not know what's in there and uh, there could be a wasp in there. There might be a large spider. Um, so don't reach blindly into the net. Always check it out very carefully from the outside. I can see that there are a number of spiders. There's two crab spiders right there. We're gonna get a closer look at them here in a moment. But uh, just those two, two rules, please adhere to them. Don't put it on anybody's head and don't reach down into the net. It's not a good idea. But we've got some neat animals here. Let me. Uh, get some of these put into small containers and we'll get a closer look at them. Good find. And you can see that the, um, all I'm sweeping through is just a, a bit of grass, short grass. In this little patch of grass right here, there may be a hundred thousand individual insects, maybe even more than that. There may be 10,000 spiders just in this little area here. One of the things that, that troubles me sometimes when I'm walking through places like this is the fact that I'm probably stepping on somebody or some small animal. And uh, that's, uh, that's one of the, the prices, I guess, a, a naturalist or somebody who wants to look at these things has to suffer with. But anyway, let's get a closer look at these guys. This horsefly is a pretty typical animal for a habitat like this in a field. Horseflies get their name because they are really common around barns and other places where horses live. They are a large blood-sucking fly that uh, has a mouth part that it can jab through the skin and a saliva that makes the blood run kind of freely and that enables them to suck up the blood that much easier. They have uh, short antennae that are able to pick up some chemicals like chemicals on the skin to tell them whether something is edible or not. And that's where insect repellents come in useful. The uh, insect repellent sends a signal through these antennae that tells the fly this isn't a good place to eat. Like all insects, the horsefly has six legs. It has three body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And as with most flies, they have two well-developed wings. 
and two underwings that are really just little tiny clubs. You can't see them without almost a microscope. Um, the horsefly and deerfly and the mosquitoes that live out here are all food for a number of animals, including barn swallows and, and other birds, and even dragonflies, which is why I don't catch dragonflies, because they would catch these guys for us. Very beautiful eyes, some of the prettiest eyes in nature. As I mentioned, there are hundreds of thousands of insects in here, Oop, and lots of spiders, including crab spiders. Crab spiders are also called flower spiders because they're very often found hanging around flower heads. This is a small one. It would take quite a bit of looking to key out exactly what species this is. It's uh, definitely a flower spider, though. Very small jaws, so it poses very little threat to people. Um, it actually feeds on some of the smaller insects like flies and uh, even mosquitoes. Male mosquitoes pollinate flowers, and when they visit the flower, this guy may be laying in wait to grab it up. The bigger crab spiders can actually grab big things like bumblebees and, and uh, honeybees. But this little one here is interested mostly in small flying insects. As with all spiders, it has eight legs and two body parts. It's hanging by a very thin bit of web right now. It really catches its prey mainly by uh, laying in wait in the flower. It doesn't use a web to catch its food. It uh, it just lays in, in hiding. Very valuable animal. All of the spiders in, in the uh, field here uh, combine to help control insect numbers. If we didn't have spiders out there, we'd have many more insects to have to deal with. And insects eat a lot of our food. So uh, we can be thankful that there are spiders. Here's a couple of uh, interesting animals. These are called stink bugs. And as their name implies, these are true bugs. Um, not all insects and spiders are bugs. Actually, only a select group of insects can be called bugs, and they include these guys here. Uh, this animal is a leaf-footed bug, and it gets its name because its hind feet are shaped very much like a small leaf. It's an animal that's found in, around flowers. It uh, has a piercing mouth part that sucks the juices right out of the plant stem. It uh, doesn't pose any threat to people because it's not interested in biting us. If it did, it would be a very painful bite. One thing that's interesting about most bugs is they stink. Um, this is sometimes called a stink bug because it has a pretty strong smell. But its smell is nothing compared to this guy here. This is a true stink bug. And if I were to accidentally get this in my mouth, it would make me quite sick. Um, I have to be careful that after holding it, I don't rub my eyes with my fingers because it would burn my eyes. And uh, I don't want to eat anything until I wash my hand because it would make my food taste really lousy. In fact, some of these insects feed on fruit like blackberries. And if you've ever eaten a blackberry that tasted really horrendous, it may taste so bad because a stink bug had eaten it, eaten on that berry before you had. Um, the stink bugs are important in insects. They uh, are sometimes pests to farmers because they can damage crops. They uh, are called stink bugs, again, because they have a bad smell, and that bad smell repels animals that would like to eat them. Any bird that's ever eaten one of these before or tasted one will never taste it again. They, they learn, birds learn very quickly not to mess with these guys. A spider will kick one of these out of its web rather than try to eat it. Um, any insect-eating insect, like a praying mantis, they will avoid it. All lizards avoid it. Really, nobody eats these guys that I can think of, because they just taste really, really bad. But they're quite attractive. This is a click beetle, but it's not one that I caught just here in the field. This animal is found under logs, rotting logs, and rotting logs can be found out in fields. This is really a treasure. Click beetles get their name because they, uh, in order to escape enemies, they click their head very quickly. And what that enables them to do, if they're on their back, it'll help turn them right side up again, but it also sends a vibration. So if something picks it up, that vibration may frighten it away. This one's called an eyed elater, and it gets that name because of these two black eye spots here, which are pretty common in nature. You see it with a lot of animals that have wings and a lot of fish. The eye spots confuse predators into thinking that this is a great big head, maybe the head of a lizard or the head of a snake. 
They've got pretty strong jaws, which they use to burrow into logs, rotting logs, so the female can lay her eggs. They, uh, like all beetles, they are insects. They have three body parts, head, thorax, and an abdomen right here. You can see how good they are at escaping. Really a beautiful, beautiful beetle. Really very fortunate to find one of these. They're not very common, but they are really very attractive. There are lots of beetles in here, but most of them are going to be quite small. The idolater is um, not, a, not a feeding animal. That is, when it's an adult, it doesn't eat, so far as we know. Only the larvae eat, and they eat uh, dead plants, plant roots, um, just, a, just an overall plant eater mainly. Really a beautiful creature. One of the most common animals that you're going to find in a field is going to be an animal that eats plants. And one of the biggest plant eaters out here is the grasshopper. Grasshoppers get their name because they have a pair of very strong jumping legs, which they use to escape enemies. They can jump a pretty good distance, but in addition to being good jumpers, they are also quite good flyers. They've got two pairs of wings, which are folded over the back, and these they use to carry themselves from field to field. When they have eaten up the plants in one field, they can move on to another. Locusts, they create plagues in some parts of the world are actually a type of grasshopper, a rather big grasshopper. This is a spur throat. It's a very common grasshopper in North America. It's got pretty short antennae. Um, the eyes are rather large. You can see light and dark very clearly. You can detect differences in plants uh, based on reflection from sunlight. Uh, the legs are really quite spiny. And these are also helpful, the spines are helpful in helping the animal get away from enemies that might want to catch it. If a mouse or a, some other, or a lizard grabbed onto the back of this grasshopper, the uh, very spiny legs would be rather painful if this grasshopper kicked it. So good weapons for uh, defense. Like all insects, it has six legs. The uh, four smaller legs are just used for holding onto things. The mouth is for chewing and it doesn't pose any threat to humans. It really just chews up plants. Grasshoppers, whenever you handle them, will very often spit out a, a, a dark brown, uh, foul-tasting liquid. Some people call it tobacco juice. It is a, 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 a foul taste that uh, repels some predators. If uh, the grasshopper has used up all of its spit to get rid of predators, then uh, it won't taste quite so bad, so they try to conserve as much of their spit as possible. That's also valuable in dry times. They try to keep as much moisture as they can. Really a, a neat looking animal. And this grasshopper here will grow to be maybe another half inch or three quarters of an inch longer. It's not full grown yet. Very common. This is an active nest of little field ants. It's a small black ant, about the same size as fire ants, but the field ant does not sting quite like a fire ant does. They're not nearly as aggressive. These are very common in field habitats like this. They have an underground burrow where the queen lives, and all of these workers are out looking for seeds. They don't eat very much animal matter, fire ants do, but these field ants eat mostly small seeds, little bits of grasses and, and other plants, and they'll take them down into their burrow where they'll feed the queen and the other workers that are down there. They're really a neat animal, and uh, like all ants, they are quite social. They, uh, they live in harmony with this field. Uh, they don't overpopulate, which would create a problem for other plants. Unlike some other ants that are here, uh, the harvester ant, that animal does create some damage. Unless you see the activity of the, of the little field ant, you may not even know it's there. But you always know when there's a harvester ant colony around because of what they do to the surrounding area around their nest. The caterpillar here is a type that is found in fields like this. I'm not sure what type of a moth or butterfly it's going to turn into, but what's really neat about this particular one is it's feeding on this, this type of flower it eats the white petals off of the, off of the flower itself. And when it's, I guess while it's eating those flowers, it uh, then grazes off some of the brown dead petals that are on that, that same flower head. 
And if you look closely at this caterpillar's body, you'll see that it's got very sharp little spines running up and down the length of its body. And it takes those brown petals and sticks them on those spines. And what this does is it enables the caterpillar to camouflage itself. It's really an excellent adaptation. The uh, animal is able to avoid predators like praying mantis, maybe some lizards, even some birds that might want to forage around in the grasses here looking for something to feed their young. But the, the caterpillar itself, when it's covered with these brown spots looks, or brown uh, flower parts, looks just like the flower itself. And uh, so this is very, very good adaptation. Again, I'm not sure who this is going to turn into or what it's going to turn into, but uh, judging by all the butterflies and moths that I see flying around in this field, I suspect it's going to be one of, one of these small brown ones. Really a beautiful little caterpillar. This butterfly is, is one of my favorite butterflies. It's a little hair streak. They're very delicate little butterflies. I didn't mean to catch it, and unfortunately, um, in the process of getting caught up in the net, you can see that the back part of its wings have, have been damaged a little bit. It'll probably be able to fly, and uh, because it's a, a butterfly that spends most of its life down low to the ground, just uh, flitting around among these flowers here, it'll probably be okay. The hair streak gets its name because of the little thread-like hair that is uh, located right at the base of each wing. Um, they're a fast-moving butterfly. When they, when they really get going, they can, they're probably among the faster of the butterflies. It uh, feeds on nectar, which it gets from the flowers that are out here. Um, if you look closely at the antennae of the hair streak, you'll see that it's got two little club-like ends. Um, that's characteristic of all butterflies. Uh, butterflies are different from moths in the way they hold their wings. At rest, a butterfly has its wings held straight up over its back. The uh, moth holds the wings um, laid down over its body. The uh, moths also have usually pointed antennae rather than club end antennae. Uh, the hair streak is really a gorgeous little, little beast out here. But again, try to avoid catching butterflies. This was an accidental catch. Um, you can see that they, they damage very easily, even in a soft mesh net. This is a, one of the, the few wasps in our area that uh, is solitary. It doesn't live in a colony with other wasps. It's, a, it's called a cow killer. Uh, another name for it is a velvet ant. This one I'm holding here is uh, incapable of stinging. It's a male. It has no stinger to it. The female usually doesn't have wings and she packs a real powerful punch. The way to tell these two apart, or tell the, the uh, velvet ant from other wasps, is this bright orange spot on the abdomen. There are some spider wasps that also have a, an orange spot on their abdomen, but if you look closely at this one, you'll see that it's covered with hair. The uh, spider wasps are pretty much hairless. Their, their body is a slick, shiny um, black, whereas the velvet ants are a very furry black with an orange spot. Orange, yellow, and red are usually warning colors in nature, so this orange here tells you to beware. Even though this animal doesn't have a sting, uh, if you see that color on an animal, it's best to leave it alone. This one here is, is the winged male, and it's going to be flying around low over the ground looking for a female. She is a, a hunter. She'll look for a caterpillar or maybe even a spider or even a wasp. And... Um, what she does is look for a burrow with a wasp in it where she can lay her egg. She's a parasite. Or she'll catch a caterpillar and stuff it down a burrow and lay an egg on it. The egg hatches out into a larvae, which feeds on that animal. Unlike uh, bald-faced hornets and paper wasps, again, these wasps live by themselves. They, they uh, do not live in a colony. But they're really, really kind of fun to watch. But be careful with them. Harvester ants get their name because they make their living gathering seeds and occasionally small animals, which they then take down into their nest to feed the developing young and, and to the queen. 
These harvester ants here are each equipped with a little stinger, just like a wasp. Uh, in fact, they are essentially a wasp without wings. Uh, so if you find some of these guys, you need to be real careful around them because they will climb onto you and defend their nest by stinging. They're not as aggressive as fire ants, but they, uh, they will protect their nest. The harvester ants build this great big dome. It looks like a dome uh, around uh, the nest entrance. And what they've done is once, they, once the queen designates an area to build the nest, all of the workers that she produces then go out and clip all the grasses and the plants that are around the, the nest entrance, and they create this barren landscape. And if you look closely at the ground, you'll see little pebbles that they've brought up from below. Uh, in fact, some scientists that study tiny fossils will go and find harvester ant nests and uh, pour through, pour over all the, the little pebbles that the ants have pulled out, and they find very small teeth from primitive animals and, and little tiny bones. So the harvester ants are actually beneficial to paleontologists. They're beneficial to us in that they get rid of some of the weed seeds that uh, farmers would have to, to deal with in their uh, fields, and they also harvest up some of the, the insects that might be a problem to us, maybe grasshoppers and some caterpillars. As you've seen, there are lots of things that live in a field. Spiders, wasps, grasshoppers, caterpillars, butterflies. Many, many different animals make their living in simple backyard habitats like a field. Whenever you go out there, if you take a sweep net with you, keep those two tips in mind. Don't put the net over your head and don't put your hand down inside. These are tools, they're not toys. And keep in mind that these animals are very delicate. They have lives that they need to live they're valuable to the environment, and uh, it's really best to just look at them briefly and then let them go. You don't need to take them home. If you do put them in a jar, remember that they're in the jar and that they need to be released in a short period of time. Hope you've had fun. Go on out and see if you can find some of these things.